So for this video, we're gonna look at joint mobility testing, specifically of the glenohumeral joint. Now, before beginning that, you should have already screened the joint both actively and passively to ensure that you understand the mobility that is present, uh, as well as possibly looked at overpressure or end fields. So let's go ahead and get started. To begin with, we're gonna look at both proximal as well as long axis distraction. Now this can be done a couple different ways. With proximal distraction, we wanna get as close to the joint itself as possible. So I'm going to adjust kind of my body so that you can see this. Now you can do this in a variety of, of um, positions. Uh, specifically, we want to use the open pack position if at all possible to somewhere between 30 and 60 degrees. Now, once we're in this position, we need to take care of the arm as well. So using your elbow and body to hold on to that is a good strategy. From here, we're ready to begin our assessment. Typically, you wanna stabilize your stationary portion of the joint while creating mobility through the opposing piece. In that case, it would be the scapula that would be stabilized and we'd want to mobilize or assess the uh, humerus and uh, more proximal ball. Uh, with that said, we can't really get our hands on the scapula, so we're going to allow the gravity and the pressure of our patient into the table to do the stabilizing for us. So we're ready to begin proximal distraction. Both hands are going to come in around the proximal humerus. Close to the joint line as we can, and we're going to create distraction. Ensure that pressure and force is uniform throughout, specifically in the anterior portion of the glenohumeral joint. You have structures like the long head of the biceps and others that can be quite sensitive if you're pressing on them, so just be careful with that. Now, that motion can also be graded on a scale of grade one through four consistent with Maitland mobilizations. Additionally, you can also grade this just from a hypo to hyper uh, a scale. Uh, that would be dependent upon looking at the uninvolved side, and that's true for any of the accessory motions that we're gonna look at today. So, again, proximal, as close to the joint as we can. We're gonna take up the slack, and then find end range and then relax, compare and contrast side to side. Long axis distraction would be looking at the entire upper extremity. So we would need to screen both the elbow as well as the wrist and hand. Though at this point, we're going to provide that distraction again. And again, comparing to our uninvolved side as well as looking for any symptom reproduction or alleviation. The next two that we're going to look at is our inferior glide, followed by our anterior to posterior glides. So for inferior glide, again, best done in kind of that mid range or open pack position. Some folks will come up to 90 degrees as well to make this assessment. We're going to do it around 60 degrees, and what you're looking to do is glide the humoral head in an inferior direction. So a C grip for your hand, your mobilizing hand or assessing hand works best. Be mindful of line of force and provide your assessment. Again, the motion is this. I'm using mostly my trunk in terms of rotation and a weight shift versus just a protraction or kind of uh, forward motion of my arm. Again, the assessment would be compared to the uninvolved side for hypo versus hyper. And then we can also grade that if we were using that as a graded mobilization treatment or interventional technique. The last one then that we'll look at is anterior to posterior prior to having our patient flip into a prone position. So anterior to posterior, we're gonna come a little bit into the horizontal plane because if we're here, not only do we uh, distort a little bit of the congruency between the humoral head and the glenoid, but additionally, we could put some of those anterior capsule fibers on a bit of stretch. 
So we're going to come into the plane of the scapula, about 30 degrees of horizontal now adduction from that more uh, horizontal plane. And from here, we're going to be mindful of that because we want to stay perpendicular. So we're not going to be straight vertical, but we're going to be slightly tilted towards midline with our mobilizing uh, hand or arm. And so now what this is going to look like is you'll notice my forearm is slightly tilted towards the patient, stabilizing here, and we provide our force in an anterior to posterior fashion. So that's an anterior to posterior, looking at our posterior capsule mobility. There's also an assessment to look at the anterior capsule. Some clinicians have done it such that it almost kind of becomes a scooping motion as such. Really best to do this in a prone position. So we're going to have our patient flip over into a prone. We're going to bring their arm out again. We're going to come into approximately that 30 degrees of horizontal adduction away from the horizontal plane. And now our force is going to be from a posterior to anterior direction. And so what this would look like is, I'm going to use my, my opposite hand just in case, uh, uh, or, or to facilitate ease of, of visualization on the camera, but you really want to stay with your same hand. In this case, I'd want to stick with my right hand since that's the hand I've been using throughout. But in any case, we're going to look at our line of force for our forearm, and we're going to assess the anterior glide of the humerus on the scapula. Now, the one benefit with this is we could come in and stabilize the scapula as well and just get a little bit better uh, assessment between these two joint surfaces. However, the amount of times that you would use this are negligible, seeing as the fact that the anterior capsule tends to be rather lax in most individuals and actually a source of hypermobility. So, we're going to allow our patient to come back into the supine position. We've looked at proximal and long axis distraction for passive accessory mobility. We've looked at an inferior glide, as well as an anterior to posterior glide, assessing the posterior capsule. And then finally, we finished with a prone posterior to anterior assessment, though that is likely to be the least utilized in terms of passive accessory motion testing. Have a go with each of these, also correlate them to what motion actively they would improve. So for example, if we're going into shoulder abduction, we need a degree of inferior glide of the humerus on the glenoid. So an inferior glide would help to restore full abduction. So correlate that with each of these motions with an understanding of our convex, concave rules as well as normal joint arthrokinematics. While you're doing this with a peer or colleague, let me know if there's any questions.